Welcome to the Black Tower. I'm your host, your guide, your brother, the sorcerer of Armana School. I'm sorry it's been so long since I've done a video. I've had health problems for about four or five days. Can't hardly walk. Oh, it was wonderful. Oh, aside from all that trippy bullshit, trivial stuff that happens to you in life, though. I am back, and this time, though, I want to take this shit a little bit deeper. Uh, in the Bible, it says, skilled is the man who can raise Leviathan, right? Oh, who is Leviathan in the Sumerian Mesopotamian belief system? But Tiamat. Well, if you actually want to be able to get to that point, which I'm not saying you can't already do it, but if you want to hear some really cool shit, well, let's do a session on Cthulhu. Cthulhu. And let's see how and what that power is and how and what that power is to us. Now, if you've got your own handy dandy Simon Necronomicon, I would like for you to turn to page X1X or 19 in the Roman numerals. Oh, this is funny. Now, we're going to start about the second paragraph here. Okay. So it says. The underworld in ancient Sumer was known by many names, among them Apsu or Abyss, sometimes as Narmataru, the great underworld ocean, and also as Kutha, or Kutu, as it is called in the Enuma Elish, the creation epic of the Sumerians. The phonetic similarity between Kutha and Kutu and Cathonic as well as Cthulhu is striking, judging by a Sumerian grammar at hand. Oh yes, we're going to have fun with these words. Do-do-do. The word Cthulhu or Cthulhu, Lovecraft's Cthulhu summarized, would mean the man of Kutu, Kutha, the man of the underworld. Now, what's so important about that? Well, herein is a secret formula. Oh, and we love so secret formulas. Here at the Black Tower, we all about some secret formulas. Uh, one of the things that drew me into the Necronomicon was that I had a there was something that called me, and I could never understand exactly what it was for like forever and a day to actually give it a name or any of this other stuff. I had no idea. As I progressed magically through uh, through the different magic systems and just in my practice in general in the first eight years, six, seven, eight years, something like that, uh, there were things that would come to me, you know, uh, you know, secrets, mysteries, so forth and so on. Things that I could understand that I have no idea how I understood them. You know, like sometimes this book here really does blow my mind that I actually understand it. And it's really strange because even though I've learned all the different types of like shamanism and ceremonial magic and ritual and all this other stuff, you would think, well, that, that explains that. But sometimes it just doesn't. Sometimes there is a spirit or an intelligence behind the thing. And that has a lot to do with us as humans. Uh, in general, in uh, in the uh, in the uh, in high magic, oh gosh, some things are Selena. They have a rite called the rite of the bornless one, the bornless one ritual, and this is it's kind of like the Abermelon ritual for the holy guardian angel and all this other stuff. Ah, uh, but we have something here so much cooler, so much cooler. And we have it in this neat and nifty handbook of do it and do it yourself. And I'm going to get to that in a minute of the Necronomicon's version of that. But first, let us turn to page 183. These incantations are said to by the hidden priest. And creatures of these powers, defeated by the elders and the seven powers, led by Marduk, supported by Enki, and the whole host of Agigi. The feeders of the old serpent, the ancient worm, Tiamat, the abyss, also called Cthulhu, the corpse god. Now, I want you to remember that, the corpse god. Because here in a little bit, we're going to come back to that term and to that word, so corpse god. Slain by the wrath of Marduk and the magic of Enki, yet who lies not dead but dreaming. He whom secret priests initiated into the black rites whose names are writ forever in the book of chaos, can summon if they but know how. Now, I ain't saying I'm some special magician, priest, black adept, whatever. What I am saying is that I understand. I understand the works. I understand the words. 
I know what they do. And that's great and fucking dandy for whatever reason that I know these things, that I know them. Super sweet go me, right? And I promise you all this will tie in together in just a minute. And then on page 202, at the very bottom it says, When the great Cthulhu rises up and greets the stars, then the war will be over and the world be won. Such is the covenant of the abominations and the end of this text. Now, I did all this all this reading back and forth because I wanted to explain something to you, show you something if I may. That in this essence, in the sense, Cthulhu is a not dead but dreaming. Uh, those of you who have read other sources also, uh, that who lies uh, beneath the sunken waves of Relay, so forth and so on, you can blend and mix these together of uh, of these systems, and the reason why is because they do they interlap with one another. It's almost as if H.P. Lovecraft, the Sleeping Prophet. And whoever's responsible for having put this text together, it's kind of like they were kind of in cahoots of some sorts, or maybe they were reading out of the same playbook. I don't know. Who will know? But I tell you what's actually kind of neat is that in the, oh, wow, well, <laughs> I forgot what it's called. Holy crap. In this particular section uh, of the book, where we're working with the ancient ones and stuff, uh, with the Duravendur and all this, that, and the other, and the walking of the gates of Ganzir and what have you. The words went from using the spirit of the earth, remember, spirit of the sky, remember, to spirit of the seas, remember, spirit of the graves, remember. Now, if you remember everything that I've said here read off, and you go back later on, check out this video, see it if it doesn't fit for yourself. They refer to the sea and the graves. I'd like to start off by saying this right here. Seas represent emotion, waters, so forth and so on. Now, what do waters do? Okay, here's a really interesting concept or an idea. They say that all that is left in the grave is memory. But what creates memory? Emotion, whether great happiness or deep sorrow and sadness create memory. And therefore, they say that memory is immoral, is immemorial, you know, forever, whatever you want to call it. Okay? And then let us think of uh, spirit of the grave. So, once again, into the realm of the dead. You know, this, uh, this whole book, I know why I'm into it. I understood a long, long time ago that I personally, I love the gods of this book. I love the, the abominations. I love the goddesses. I love the whole thing. And you might be thinking that, you know, well, yeah, because, you know, you work with this, you work with that. Up until this last year, I never worked with the, uh, with the Zoni, with the elder gods. That was never my thing. I didn't dismiss them or you know anything like that it's just what my cup of tea when the kind of magic i work i i work a different kind of magic than most people i do call it sorcery because for lack of better words it is it involves strong emotion and it involves a death current and the necronomicon is steeped in de in the death current because no other if, if you had to think of it this way the necronomicon itself you now it's called the book of the dead names it should just be called Book of the Dead because it would make more sense. And the reason why is because it opens you to a death current. Because you cannot be reborn, transformed, unless you die. And I don't mean physically die. You know exactly what kind of death I'm talking about. It's a change, it's a transformation. It's where you're reborn. Uh, my own symbol of the key with the three... The three arms on it, that's what it's symbolic of. The loop at the top is the halo where where it was talking about, you know, gave the gave the dragons uh halos as of gods. So, you know, the loop on the key is like the halo of a god. The three arms would be the three wings, you know, you have the underworld, the middle world, and the other world, or the overworld, whatever you want to look at it as. 
all this, that, and the other. And then you take a symbol like that, and it symbolizes powering the person. And then you take into all the different, the key factors of dying and transformation. You know, it's, it's not enough to desire a thing, but to gain anything, you must lose something. You know, as Lama, uh, Lama Du Dingir, a priest of the Necros, was talking about when he was talking about the way to Ganzir, you know, with that, with that flip switch where, you know, you had to leave something behind so that you could exit the room. Well, I have, have no illusions about it. The death current requires a sacrifice. I, you know, when I started off, I was young. Hell, I had no, I, I had no reason not to. And I was really attracted to this system. And as I got older, I started having things that were, you know, oh, I don't want to lose this. I don't want to lose this, you know. And I kept thinking, well, holy crap, you know, these powers have always been there. But, you know, there's going to be that day they want to take this and they want to take that. And it's just, it's it's illusion. And it's, and it's falsehood at its finest. Because you'll always know that a sacrifice is something personal, something meaningful. And something that you've outgrown and that you do not need that needs to change. And you give it up. And now sometimes if you're lucky, you can be the one to give it up. But if you're like me and you're the kind of person that's been doing this for over two decades. Pretty much you, you kind of let be whatever will be, will be. Because, you know, things come in and things go out. It's just the rule of it. But the thing is, is and I'm not trying to scare you or anything like that, but I am trying to express this point of view before I go any further, that being a death current, that, you know, this is where I came up with the concept of being a sorcerer is because I'm all about this. There's no, there's no part of myself that I'm not willing to ascend beyond and above, you know. That doesn't mean I have a death wish. I don't want to die physically. You know, who can enjoy my annoying voice and face if I'm not here to do it? Therefore, you know, I want to be here a little while. You know, I'm sure my wife does too. You know, after all, keep her keep her heart ticking. But, you know, aside from all that, let us talk about what is the Black Adept. Let us talk about the Sorcerer, the Black Priest of this, of this system. You know, because when you think Priest, you're always thinking, oh... You know, oh, he's a servant of the gods. He gives this and he gives that and he's kind to the people and he does this and he does that. <laughs> Fools. I don't even think so, man. Nope. I, I, I will give and I will help people if it is worth doing. If it's one of those people that just wants everything gave to them, hell no. Hell no. I mean, dude, I, I, nothing was given to me for free. Nothing will be given to you for free. The things that are given to you for free, though, there are things like this, like with this video and stuff, you know, trying to explain to you how this really works, how, you know, what makes it tick, what, you know, all this, that, and the other. And, and in this process, you become an isolate individual that'll stand up for yourself, take up for yourself, and do everything in your power to provide for yourself instead of sitting there looking for the handout or looking for this or looking for that, you know. When I think of what a true black adept is, when I think of what a sorcerer really is, I don't I don't see somebody sitting back that kills babies or that, you know, and, and, and a sacrifice to some being with horns. And I don't sit there and I think about somebody who is a complete total asshole to everybody because, you know, that's the that's the dark thing to do. Or the one who says, I am I am a god and you are nothing. Yeah, whatever. Or whatever. Yeah, they could get to the back of the line there because there's enough people on that list. You know, but a true sorcerer, a true black adept is somebody who who dives into this shit not because they think it's cool to be evil. Not because they have an imbalance. But it's somebody who understands that to truly become, you must lose all that you already are. And that is a sorcerer. That is a black adept. Uh, but anyway, enough with all the seriousness. Well, let's get on to some fun fun. Now, I said that I would explain to you. There was a, the Necronomicon has it all. It really does. It, 
it's a spell book. It's a do-it-yourself guide. The whole thing, it's there. If you can just piece it together, which I try my best to. On to how we are Cthulhu. How we are Cthulhu. How we are the man of the underworld. How we are the priest of Gansir. Because, check that. Okay, so let us go to page 195. It says at the very bottom here, uh, let's see, and the altar shall be of a large rock set in the earth, and a sacrifice acceptable unto the nature of the God should be made. And at the time of the calling, the waters of Psu will roll, and Cthulhu will stir, but unless it is time, he will not rise. And this is the conjuration of the dead God. Why does everybody always overlook that? Conjuration of the dead God. Who's the dead God? Cthulhu's the dead God. You remember all the stuff we were talking about Cthulhu? Well, guess what? The black adept, the sorcerer, the magician. Oh, my God. You're Cthulhu, man. You are Cthulhu. You. And let, let us get into this now. It says, May Namtar open my eyes that I may see. May, Am may Namtar open my ears that I may hear. May Namtar open my nose that I may sense his approach. May Namtar open my mouth that my voice will be heard to the far reaches of the earth. May Namtar strengthen my right hand that I shall be strong to keep the dead under my power, under my very power. Where in that does it sound like they're trying to invoke a thing or to evoke? No, they're awakening. This is an awakening. This is how you awaken the God of the underworld. This is your shadow self. This is your true, your true dark guardian. I conjure thee, O ancestor of the gods. I summon thee, creature of darkness, by the works of darkness. I summon thee, creature of hatred, by the words of hatred. Hatred, that's kind of strong, ain't it? I summon thee, creatures of the waste, by the rights of the waste. I summon thee, creature of pain, by the words of pain. I summon and call thee forth from the abode, from thy abode in darkness. I evoke thee from the resting place in the bowels of the earth. I summon thine eyes to behold the brightness of my wand, which is full of the fire of light. Hatred, waste, pain. What is it that we feel on a daily basis, those of us even drawn to dark paths? There is some immortal sense or feeling inside us. Something that is beyond life, and we're not talking about, you know, uh, uh, chronic depression or whatever you want to call it. We're not talking about stuff like that. No, it's a sensing. It's something inside you. You either feel greatly and deeply, or you don't. And to deal, feel deeply and greatly, a lot of things in life cause these feelings, and that's where this conjuration comes from. It's how you summon the true sleeper. You remember in the uh, Conjuration of the Watcher, cease to be the sleeper of Agura? Well, this is kind of how you raise the dead god that you are. This is the this is the summoning of the Bornless One in the Necronomicon. It's so beautiful. I conjure thee, O ancestor of the gods. I summon thee, creature of darkness, by the works of darkness. I summon thee, creature of hatred, by the works of hatred. I summon thee, creature of the waste, by the rights of the waste. I summon thee, creature of pain, by the words of pain, by the four square pillars of earth that support the sky. Four square pillars of earth that support the sky. Siddhi, Gura, Martu, Urulu. Four pillars. Ain't that beautiful? That is seriously sexy stuff. By the four square pillars of earth that support the sky, may they stand fast against them that desire to harm them. Oh, see, that's what your shadow is so supposed to do. That's what your, that's, that's, you know, your true self, your, your, your uh, heart of hearts, uh, your sacred center, always to defend, always to protect you, always to be you, truly how you really are. I summon thee in thine ears to hear the word that is never spoken except by the Father, the eldest of all who know me, who know, who know age. The word that binds and commands is my word. 
and then the power words. I conjure thee, O ancestor of the gods. I summon thee, creature of darkness, by the works of darkness. I summon thee, creature of hatred, by the works of hatred. I summon thee, creature of the waste, by the rights of the waste. I summon thee, creatures of pain, by the words of pain. I summon thee and call thee forth from thy abode in darkness. I evoke thee from thy resting place in the bowels of the earth. May the dead rise. May the dead rise and smell the incense. That is just too beautiful. You know, I think of, you know, I did the Bornless One ritual. I've done this thing called the, uh, the Rite of the Beast, which was a higher order of something that Crowley had done. I've done all kinds of rites and workings and things to bring my inner self out. That particular calling, though, is quite powerful. And it's, and if you're sincere with it, if it's something you, you ring to, you resonate with, there is no turning back. Once you res that particular thing, now it goes on to give you warnings about, you know, that if that call doesn't work, don't do it again for such and such, for it may be somewhere else, and blah, 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 and yeggity schmeggity. Traps, foul play, words, whatever. I have a feeling that if you mean it the first time you say it, it'll work. Just how I am. You absolutely mean it. If you understand it, if you understand it on a personal level, raise the God. Raise the God within you. You know, don't be surprised if weeks, months, years after you've done that, you know, you feel like there's something a bit sinister inside you. You're not possessed. Don't be afraid. It's you. That's your shadow self. That's your daemon. That's your holy daemon. That's your that's your the true ass kicker coming to the surface. Get to know it. it. Has a name. It will give you its name. You and it'll be one on one. And unlike a lot of spirits, this thing doesn't require offering at all. It, by its very nature, is you. It is what they would call the soul as you're living this life. Your soul is collecting pieces and stuff and putting itself together. Well, this particular rite is like when man was crafted from the clay. Okay? But in this case, instead of clay, you have the soul stuff. And that this is this is a man or a woman standing there for this flat rock saying this prayer, calling this conjuration, this resurrection. That's like how I like to look at it as a resurrection, kind of like necromancy just gone off ten ways to cool as hell. But when you do this, that is the birth of the black light Inside you, the black flame, which is it, the the power of what the soul is made of, and I know I didn't really, I haven't gone into detail on that. I won't right now, but I've been, I've just, I've been doing so rough the last couple of days. Most of the time, I'm having to lay out on the couch because I can't stand walk. It's like I said, it's been a lot of fun, but I wanted to do a video. But if I'm going to do a video, I'm going to do a video where I'm actually giving you something that's worth a shit, something you can do, something that you can think on, something you can work with, something that, you know, will empower you and make you strong. I wish each and every single one of you peace and blessings from the Black Tower. Until next time.